Hello everybody, good evening if you're watching this when you're supposed to be, or even good afternoon. For the rest of you, good morning, and at least I appreciate you trying to get this done. Okay, so today we're going to talk about one of my fave cultures in ancient times, and, and really one of my favorite periods of study, and I'm learning a lot about it now, the Maya. Love the Maya, so exciting, so different, um, really gave us a lot of stuff. Wish we had more information on them, I'll tell you why, but let's get right to it. All right, the Maya started all the way back around 2000 BCE. Now, the Maya we put into two basic time periods. There's the pre-classical and the classical, and I'll explain what happens. But the establishment of the Maya happens from around 2000 BCE to about 250 BCE. And if you look down here where my mouse is out, this is where they started. In the uh, area of Central America, Guatemala, a little bit of Belize over here, but really it was primarily Guatemala. And the Mayans are going to establish some really crucial things for us that have influenced us today. And really the Mayans, except for maybe the Aztecs later on, by far the most advanced group in the Americas. Written language. Number one, most important thing, period. And really, they're almost the only culture in all of North or South America in ancient times that had a written language. Uh, everybody else was just spoken, and still a lot of them are spoken today. If you look at the native languages of North America, as well as out of South America, like no one was writing. The Olmecs maybe kind of sort of almost did, not 100% sure. So we give it to the Maya. And not only did the Maya have a written language, but it evolved. At the top, you can see up here with the mouse, you've got the pictograms and the ideograms. Down here, you've got an actual language. And yes, you've got multiple things that mean A and B, but that's okay. you got to figure it out. And this crazy question mark thinking here and how that's an X, I don't know. But hey, it's an alphabet. And that's a huge step. I mean, China still hasn't developed into that. So obviously, big deal here. So written language, huge in the Americas. Then agriculture. On the top left, you've got maize and really cool looking maize. I mean, I love this stuff. I'll eat that all day, red and green and, and purple and all sorts of really cool colors. On the right, you've got your cotton. Cotton, we know what it's used for, really, really important as well. But it's the bottom two pictures, kids. This is just, it's just pure awesomeness. On the bottom left, that is cacao. What's that, you ask? That's chocolate, my friends. And what kind of world would we live in without chocolate? I, I mean, I, I just don't think I could be there. Unless you get migraines, then you're not supposed to have chocolate. Then don't eat chocolate. I didn't tell you to eat chocolate. Everybody else, feel free. It's fantastic. On the right, of course, you've got what so many people need to just survive. You're like, wait, that's like red and green berries? No, kids, that's not berries. Those are coffee beans. And then you cook them, and then you grind them, and it's deliciousness. Okay, what would we be in a world without coffee. I don't think we need Starbucks regular coffee because any company that calls their largest size at all, it bothers me. But coffee is here to stay and we can thank the Mayans. But, oh no, boom, disaster. We're not exactly 100% sure, but the early Mayan period, it basically blows up. Here you see a picture of people which looks to be with a huge amount of stuff on their back walking away and they're walking away because the Mayans, and we have this from writing, basically destroyed themselves. If you don't think that humans can destroy the planet, just look at the ancient Mayans. It seems like they over-farmed, they distressed the land, basically triggering a famine. So then people weren't eating. That famine caused a disease, and the people had to flee. And so the Mayans destroyed themselves and it was really tragic and it really could have been the end to the mines luckily enough they're able to reestablish. but nonetheless here's an example of if you don't take care of your environment problems happen however the mines were able to come out of that and then establish an incredible second culture the classical period from the years 250 to 900 and it's in the classical period that you really have the flowering of the culture and that is despite the fact that they didn't have a lot of cool stuff like metal 
They had no metal. There's no metal. Mexico, Central America, they, they just don't have it. It was ridiculous. So they did all this stuff with basically stone-on-stone -stone tools. They also didn't have any large animals. Unfortunately, when we came over, the humans came over on the land bridge, which we talked about, all the cool animals left. The cattle, the horses. I mean, the largest animal in the Americas was a llama. I mean, I guess you can use them to make, like, gloves, but it's a llama. It doesn't like to carry stuff. So all the work had to be done by hand. All the stone that they used to build their cities carried on their backs. They were definitely at a distinct disadvantage. But they did have some cool foods like, hey, turkey on the left. That's a Mexican turkey. They gave us that. So, hey, Thanksgiving coming up soon. Thank you, Mexico. And on the right, the honeybee. Honeybees are hugely important. They're actually the base of much of our uh, food system because of the pollination. So without them, no plants, no plants, no food. They also give us honey, which is delicious and coincidentally enough, the only food that won't spoil, bonus. But the most important thing is watch out. Yes, that is a chihuahua. But the only other animal they had domesticated was the dog. So, and like the small dog. We're not talking about some giant Great Dane walking around that's up to my shoulder. It's a chihuahua, which the most important thing it does is bark really weird, and today it can be carried in a purse. So, yes, not a lot of help with the animals. But despite that, they were able to build incredible cities. We did have a city-state government, and we know that means fighting. Yes, fighting, and then fighting, and fighting some more. But their cities were absolutely incredible. We have to give them the best city planners outside the Indus Valley. Uh, you have public plazas, you have huge temples, you have trading centers or you know area where they would, would sell stuff. You have observatories like we have today to look at the stars. They really liked looking at stars. They had residential areas. They had palaces for the kings. They had streets and all of this in the middle of a jungle, which is ridiculous. The largest of these cities was probably Palenque, and you know what's big when this picture right here, that's where the king lived. The king at the top of the social structure, after him were the priests, and then pretty much everybody else in the middle. Here's another picture of a, of a temple in Palenque, just absolutely beautiful. Here is the far away view to give you an idea of the size. Again, follow the mouse. This is a pyramid. Here we have, and we're going to bury the king over there. Here we have where the king's going to live. You've got other types of, these are marketplaces, and just a cool path for tourists. Tikal, which is another great, great city, and boasted some of the larger pyramids. Here is a pyramid of the great jaguar. Same thing with the Egyptians, and we talked about that possible link with the Olmecs, but we have our pyramids again, and we bury our kings in them. This is the city of Tulum. This is actually the only coastal city, which is very, very interesting because a lot of people, we go back to food, they, oh, they probably fished a lot. Well, they didn't have any cities on the coast, so no, they didn't. But my favorite city is Chichen Itza because Chichen Itza holds a lot of really cool things. Um, here's a lot of uh, basically what's left of what we think is a large public plaza. Let's look over here, follow the mouse, boom, observatory. Put a telescope in this and you have the exact same thing we see today absolutely remarkable but my favorite is the great pyramid these guys were really good at math which i'll talk about in a minute and could follow eclipses and the sun and the moon and so they decided to calculate the year and the mayan year was 365.242 days guys they were a whopping 17 seconds off which most of us did not figure out until like the 1800s and these guys did it about 2,500 years ago. And what's even cooler, like, you know, we have our little wall calendars, like, you know, maybe you have a sports team or, you know, if you're into that, maybe a Justin Bieber calendar or something along that line. No, these guys built a calendar. So they have 10 months in their calendar. Each one of these levels is a month. There are 365 steps. So each step would indicate where you were in a month 
and shadows would fall during the day to tell you what day of the week that it was. Pretty awesome. But this is my favorite. Here are some snake heads at the bottom. Calendars were really kept for one thing, guys. No one really cares how many years they had gone. What they care about is when they need to plant food and when they need to harvest food so they don't die. Well, the time where they planted food was the spring equinox. That means the e equal time of light and day, and then they knew it was time to plant. The time to harvest was the fall equinox, so it's time to get all your food. So what did they figure out? Well, on and this still works today, guys. On each fall and autumn equinox, the Great Pyramid of Chichen Itza makes a snake. Look at the shadows. Look at the snake. How incredible is that? No, no aliens. It's just the people were really smart. Just, it's just incredible. Let's keep going on. Boom, trade networks. Look at this. These guys built roads through the jungle. Remember, a jungle, it constantly grows. You have to keep it clear. Yet these guys had roads and they traded actually all the way up to, this is Lakes Tecoco. It's Coco up here. Hey, these are where the Aztecs would be. Here is down here in Panama, and there's evidence that then these picked up other trading networks that would go into the Americas and then down into South America. Again, economics makes the world go round. And here's an example of the wonderful bridge and road that goes through the jungle. Incredible. Lots of art. We've got painting. We've got sculpture. We've got reliefs. But the most important is we've got math. We talked about this kind of with Chichen Itza, and we talked about this with the cities. If you think about it, you have to know geometry. You have to get that stuff right. You can't build big things in straight streets and streets through jungles if you don't know math. And the key thing that these guys had in math, they gave us a wonderful um, advance, and that is the use of zero. Zero is absolutely remarkable. It's a game changer for math. I'm not going to get into mathematical theory and proofs and stuff like that. But without zero, you can't do higher level functions like algebra, trigonometry, and stuff like that. Now, the Aztecs didn't quite get to that, but they were really close to it. The Indians would give us algebra and trigonometry. Eventually, the Europeans giving us calc. But the basis was found in the Mayan system using zero. So the Mayans could do positive and negative numbers and had a great idea of how number theory worked. They also had a mathematical notation system that allowed them to do positive and negative numbers and also allowed them to do higher level mathematical functions. This type of thing, for instance, the Greeks didn't have it. The Romans didn't have it. They had those godforsaken letters that it's impossible to do math. So if you looked in the ancient world, who was the most efficient mathematicians? It's the Mayans. And then they created that cool calendar, as we see the picture over here, which, yes, wasn't until the end of the world, which once again was to keep track of everything so they knew when to eat. So math can't beat it. Cities can't beat it. Sculpture can't beat it. And then they had religion. We know it was crucial because some of the few writings that have survived after the Spanish conquered this area were on religion. And the Popol Vuh was a big one right here. This is what is the Popol Vuh. So it's one of the few actual writings we have. And it's a very interesting look on to see how the Aztecs, or not the Aztecs, I'm sorry, the Mayans looked at life. They were a polytheistic religion that believed in lots of gods. And they felt that their gods provided for them, but their gods needed gifts in exchange. And if they didn't get that, the gods would punish them. So the way that it works is that the Mayans believed that the gods created people through spilling out their blood and using their blood to form the basis for us. So, as a result, in order to give that back, the Mayans in their religious practices would practice bloodletting. They would cut tongues and arms and bleed out onto altars to sacrifice to that god. At the highest ceremonies, they would also occasionally do uh, sacrifices. Now, I'm not trying to belittle what that's doing. It's incredibly violent, and to just kill people to sacrifice to the gods isn't the nicest thing to do. I'm not saying do that. But it gives us an idea of the relationship of the Mayans with their gods. It was very, very close-knit. They believed the gods watched out for them, and they needed to provide things to the gods. I wish it was something else, but alas, it was not. Now, the last thing I like to talk about, though, is, hey, sports. I'm a big sports guy, so I'm biased. But the Mayans are the, one of the very first cultures we actually have in history that seem to really 
uh, loves sports. Uh, their big sport or their ball game that we call Pocatoke, although we don't know what it was called, goes all the way back to about 1500 BCE. And we know it was crucial because they had a stadium, as you see here, here's a stadium, in every single city. So if they had it, it must have been important. And here is a text that goes back about 2,500 years showing the game. It was played with a large rubber ball. It wasn't that big. It was about the size of a basketball. And the way the game worked is here's a cross-section of the field is that teams would take this ball and they would pass it to each other. And their goal was to get it through this hoop up here, as you can see with the mouse. Now that's pretty high up, but the thing is they couldn't throw it. They could bounce it off their uh, elbow or their knee or their hip or maybe even their head, but they couldn't catch it or kick it. So it was incredibly difficult and actually fairly low scoring. And the guys would actually tackle each other like rugby. So it was an incredibly violent game. And the ball, even though it was made of rubber, was very hard. So the ball itself was known to break limbs. So you want to talk about a tough game. I mean, these guys knew how to be tough just as tough as any football or rugby player out there. The game was also sacred. Uh, it had its foundations in their mythology and had to do with their creation myth. And so this game was actually always played on the high holidays in which you would have the sacrifices to the gods. Unfortunately, the sacrifices that were made were often the losers of the game. They would typically play in games of two, teams of two or four. So not trying to belittle it, just saying that it wasn't a lot of, you know, it wasn't a lot of people, but still. But that's really cool in the sense that you see a, a game that's also sacred and that it becomes part of the culture. And if you think about it today, this influences us, not the, the whole sacrifice part. Definitely not a fan. But the idea of sports as entertainment as a way to unify a culture. And this is just another reason why I said I love the Mayans. And what you got to know, really, guys, in the end, is this is the basis. This is the basis of, of the Americas. These guys are crucial. These guys set the tone for everybody else. The Aztecs will have the largest empire, but they just build off the Mayans. And in the end, this is really just a fantastic culture that we're still learning more about today. So don't forget your questions. And today, guys, let's see who follows directions. I need one comment from everybody at the bottom of this page on the YouTube. Go to the YouTube link, click on the comments, and tell me what you're thinking of these videos. I want positives or negatives. I need some feedback, okay? That's a five-point homework if you do it. I'll see you guys tomorrow.